Welcome to K9 Revolution Radio. Presented by K9 Revolution Dog Training, enhancing the dog and owner relationship through education, balance, and pack instinct. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of K9 Revolution Radio. I'm your host today, Chad. We got Chris hey. and Kevin on scene, on site, ready to roll. We got Ben. Good to go. He just operating the, the cameras, camera. operating the microphones, time, making sure we're uh, on track, on target, on time, on target, right? On time. All right. We're not on time right now. No. We were supposed to start this an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about some of our favorite books that we've read in 2020. We're supposed to be reviewing three of our favorite books, but I've got four here. And these are my favorite books from 2020, even though these books were not all written in 2020. And I've read some of these books before 2020, but then I read them again in 2020. They're so good. <laughs> but we wanted to share these with our listeners. And uh, these books, I've got two books that apply strictly to dogs, and I've got two books that apply uh, to people, human psychology type stuff, developing yourself as a uh, person, developing your relationships, how you interact and deal with people. So... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, without further ado, we're going to jump into the first one. <laughs> what? They still saw the binding when you flipped it. Yeah. <laughs> and the title's on the back of it. Without further ado, we're going to jump into the first book here. Highly recommended for anybody into the dog stuff, anybody into dog body language, understanding more about your dog, how dogs operate, dog's ancestors, the wolf. And the book title is Dog Language, an encyclopedia of canine behavior. And the uh, author is Roger Abrantes, okay? Good dude, right? So this book, again, is it's like an encyclopedia, so it goes from A to Z. It's a little bit different format than you'd uh, normally see in a book, so it goes from A to Z, and it just gives a nice explanation of what that term is. And if you guys know me, I'm super into terminology. He really is. Love terminology. I've written my own SOP on terminology, so... Mm -hmm. Anyway, really dig this book for people like me, for people like us. So I'm just going to get in here and uh, get into some of the contents of the book. But while I'm flipping through a couple pages and find something good, and while I'm reading these books, I always highlight it just so I can go back, review some of my notes on the book, right? Okay. So let me find something good. You guys got anything to add about this book? Yeah, so with that one, I mean, just keep in mind that even, you know, uh, inside of the career field you know it is still a lot to digest you know mm -hmm. it is a very sciencey book uh so when oh, you're yeah. reading that you know take it slow take your time there's a lot of research that goes into that i will note that when he wrote that book they said it was fourteen thousand years uh that dogs have been companions with humans in mm -hmm. order to help hunt uh since then actually i don't know if i told you i read a story that popped up like two months ago they found a skeleton buried with a dog from 24,000 years ago. Oh, Dang. really? So now we have 10,000 more years of, you know, what what <laughs> occurred, cow. what did we learn, you know, yeah. a lot of stuff that's lost <laughs> in history. But all in all, definitely definitely a good book. Yeah. I agree 100%. Uh, <laughs> agree 100%. You got been good, on that one. Good one. <laughs> good one, Chris. Good. Uh, let me get in here real quick. Oh, so... One other thing, just to branch off of what Kevin said, you know, we're reading. When, so uh, the way we do things here is our trainers are assigned a reading assignment once a week. We meet once a week. We read our highlights together, you know, and review our notes. And uh, just based on our different levels of experience, based on our different viewpoints, based on our different different interpretations, it allows us to have a better discussion about the material, a better understanding of the material, you know, as we're going through it. Because we get we get to experience our each pers our different perspectives on it, right? You know what I'm saying. And then for new trainers that come in, and maybe they're just a trainer apprentice, you know, maybe they make it to certification, maybe they don't. But if they join us at the at the discussion table with their reading assignment, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, they're going to have experience, you know, experienced trainers being able to explain to them. You know, okay, this makes sense, and here's why. Right. Here's what I've seen in my experience in training dogs for four years or five years or however long that individual person has been training. You know what I'm saying? That really made more sense to me with a hands-on approach. Yeah. Like once I started doing it, I started, oh, okay. You know, yeah. yeah. you read it, you're like, 
I mean, there was times where I was reading that I had to go back and reread the same paragraph yeah, yeah. to make sure I was processing everything he said. But I mean, yeah. a lot of information out there, and he does his best to you know present mm-hmm. it to where it's digestible. Yeah. But, you know, still just take your time with it. It's well, very science-y, like you yeah. said, you yeah. know. Well, this is, this is also why I like, like you said, rereading books. You know what I mean? So, like, every, I feel like every year we, we continually develop and we learn new things. We're, we're always honing that craft. Yeah. So you go back and reread these books and, you know, something new always pops out to me. You know, oh, oh yeah, you know, that, that, is, that is that. Or it reminds me of a case that I had this year or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. Always, always good to continue to absorb this in, information. And everything's yeah. always taken with a grain of salt. You know, Absolutely. you can't just read that one book and be like, all right, I know it now. Yeah, good know point. exactly yeah. what I'm good doing. Point. You know, yeah. there's a lot of different viewpoints on some things that may <laughs> not be as clear. Yep. Uh, in the dog world, so it's just good information to process and to yep. have. And this book was published in 1997. Yeah. So since then, and this is a compilation of information from, like you said, years and years prior. And since then, there's been more information uncovered. You know what I'm saying? So like mm-hmm. you said, take it with a grain of salt. Understand it based on your experience, what's going on. Don't take this as everything. Yeah. Right. You know, it's just information. Some's good. Some's probably not good. You know, but it's good to be exposed to it, mm-hmm. have a discussion about it, talk, talk to people uh, about it that are experienced in the field that we're talking about, you know. But if you're just a pet owner, you've got a dog and you're interested in learning more things or understanding more things, books like this are going to help you open up that window to further understanding. Right. Peel back the layers, if you will. Peel, peel back the onion layers. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought that really? up. Really, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> thought we were going to make a whole episode about All right, so let's jump down. right into the book on page 46. You guys are going to love my first uh, highlight that I'm going to talk about, and it's uh, anthropomorphism. Oh, yeah. I knew it. I knew it. I didn't even have you to ask. That's number one thing, man. Yeah. So I'm just going to read this section just so you get a taste of how he writes this book. Anthropomorphism means to attribute human characteristics and intentions to animals. In scientific approaches, we must beware of anthropomorphism which can lead to misunderstandings of animal behavior and the formulation of incorrect hypotheses. Dog owners are often likely to give their dogs human characteristics and motives such as jealousy, guilt, premeditation, and so on, and these lack any kind of factual basis. And so that's the end of that section. But again, anthropomorphism, applying human characteristics and intentions to animals, which most people do you know what i'm saying and sometimes you know it's not a terrible thing it's like okay but in a lot of cases you got this strong powerful dominant dog you got the owner who's treating it like it's a child Mm -hmm. this dog hurts the owner hurts somebody because it's not being treated like a dog it's not being treated like a pack animal it's being treated like a human child you know what i'm saying and it uh, it's not supposed to be like that you know what i'm saying so that's just a quick on anthropomorphism. And again, he talks about jealousy. Dogs don't get jealous, but they do get dominant. Right. So a lot of times when people think they see jealousy in a dog, it's actually dominance. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but yeah, anything to touch on that one, guys? I mean, all the, see, the emotions is like one of the big gray area when it comes to dogs. You know, how intricate are their emotions? Obviously, you know, they don't have a wider a range that we do. Yeah. Because things like jealousy, you can say, oh, that's dominance. Or, you know, depression. That's insecurity. You know, it's not depression as we understand it. It's insecurity in that dog at that moment. So, you know, with anything, anthropomorphism just reminds us to take a step back and understand dogs in a way that applies to the dog, not in a way that applies to us. But definitely the number one thing, you know, especially nowadays, you know, dogs are the babies, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, anthropomorphism, it uh, it breeds mismanagement and can definitely breed breed some issues. Oh, Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is that anthropomorphism. That's the reason why I recommend you read all these books, you know, because everything we do should be about better understanding our dogs and how they think, how they perceive the world instead of us making assumptions or or putting our own emotions onto it. Like, oh, well, you know, if I was in that situation, this is how I would feel. So when I see the tail like that, that's probably what they're they're thinking. Right. right? And now something happens where a kid gets bit or another dog gets bit or you get bit by your own dog. And it's, there's just a min- misunderstanding. Yeah. So that's why it's important to take in this kind of knowledge so that you can truly objectively look at things from your dog's perspective and not your perspective. Or he yeah. destroyed my house because he's mad at me. Right. Because he's, he's, you know, he's vengeful. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because I, oh, I yeah. went to work. <laughs> All right, next uh, highlighted I just got to talk about. I just flipped the page of this one. <clears throat> bite inhibition. Mm. Bite inhibition is the behavior displayed by a dog when it does not bite an opponent 
although it would be easy for it to do so. Most dogs will limit themselves to grasping or mouthing the opponent without causing damage. Inhibition mechanisms play a major role in interactions between aggressive social animals, preventing damage and death during conflict. Healthy dogs show distinctive bite inhibition mechanisms. If conflicts cannot be solved by displays of dominance or submission, individuals may then fight. Sometimes fights are fast and furious and yet no damage, and yet no damage occurs. Inhibition mechanisms regulate rank ordering disputes. Wolves or dogs only show uninhibited attacks when they want to force an opponent to leave the pack, such as when the alpha female is in heat and wants to get rid of direct competitors. <clears throat> so real quick, by inhibition, that was, that was kind of sciencey. Mm -hmm. But if you break it down like we do during our discussions, and most people will be familiar with this, you got two dogs. They're hanging out. They're playing. All of a sudden, they get into a fight, right? One dog grabs the other one thrashes them around a little bit let's go right the other dog does nothing back it's showing submission to the dog that did the we'll call it an attack mm -hmm. you know but really they're just showing dominance and submission no damage has been caused by this interaction at all that is an example of bite inhibition where the dog that grabbed the other one with its mouth and thrashed it around is merely applying a correction mm -hmm. to the other dog from what that first dog perceived it needed to apply in a correction for Right. Like that dog had every ability and opportunity to rip that dog's neck right. open. Right. If it wanted to. Right. Right. But the fact that they're not, that's inhibition. But right. humans see it. Oh, my dog's now aggressive. He's, yep. He's yep. trying you know. to kill him. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and bite inhibition is healthy. It's good to have. However, that doesn't mean that your dog should be running around thrashing right. every dog. Sure. Sure. You still got to make sure you go through the <laughs> like training nice. process. Whose neck are we going to go bite today? <laughs> oh, mine? It's rewarding yeah. to the dog, though. He's having <laughs> yeah. a good time. Oh, yeah. And that dog's getting more dominant every time. <laughs> so another example is you got two dogs. They're playing. All of a sudden, they get into a fight. Now there's serious damage caused to one of the dogs or both dogs. That's not bite inhibition. They're bleeding. They got flesh missing. They have to go to the ER or whatever. Yeah. Maybe one dies. That's not bite. That's not bite inhibition. Those two dogs were legit fighting. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Maybe they did not have an inhibition mechanism or maybe it, what they weren't able to inhibit their bite. They went too far. They don't know how to inhibit their bite. Never learned through. Never learned how to do that through their socialization or early experiences. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe the dog just uh, is a go-getter. You know, mm -hmm. doesn't want to inhibit its bite. Yeah. You know, wants to cause damage. He knows what he's doing. Used right. to making the decisions on his own as yeah. is, so exactly. just going with it. Yep. So bite inhibition is a good thing, but that's just one example of something that we discuss in the book here, you know, for you to understand about dogs, right? But in any case, whether your dog displays bite inhibition or not, you should still be supervising those interactions, providing the necessary leadership, so on and so forth, right? <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see. Let me flip through here real quick. See if we got anything else that pops out in my head. Classical conditioning. Good one. <clears throat> All right, let's keep going. Displacement activity. <clears throat> Displacement activity is all activity performed to change the motivation in a given situation. The individual tries to achieve a sense of security by performing an activity which it feels safe with and connects with pleasure. The most common displacement activity in male dogs is marking territory by urinating. Picking objects up and carrying them is another example of typical displacement activity, especially in situations where owners pressure their dogs to solve a problem they don't understand. Right? So, stop right there. So, displacement activity, your dog's doing something other than what we want them to at any point in time. Or maybe they don't know what to do, so they start doing something weird or out of context displacement activity, you pick up on that as a trainer, as a dog owner, depending on what your dog, and you realize you may need to provide some more leadership and guidance at that point in time, right? Or if you're trying to take a walk with your dog, then all of a sudden it's peeing on every tree, every fence post, every fire hydrant. You know what I'm saying? It's just displacing from the walk. It knows you want to walk. It's like, I'm going to take control of this walk. Start stopping and peeing everywhere, you know? Maybe you got a dog in the house. You got people coming over. This dog just grabs something, starts walking around with it in the house. That could be a displacement activity because the dog doesn't know what to do at that point in time. You know what I'm saying? So just something else to, but to pay cute. attention to. 
It's cute, yeah. It's cute it's until cute. it's like humping. You know, it's a displacement <laughs> activity. Uh, sometimes that's cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's flip through here. Get one more out of this book before we, before we move on to the next one. All right, habit. Ooh, see what we say here. I like habits. Habits are behavior patterns which are frequently displayed. The advantage of habits is that the individual does not need to use a great amount of energy in order to produce the behavior pattern in question. Habits save energy in as much they do not require great brain activity and feedback from the senses. All animals develop habits, and our dogs are very likely to perform the same routines and routines and rituals, routines and rituals. day after day. <laughs> That wasn't even scripted. We should encourage our dogs to build habits which benefit our own daily routine. That was powerful. That is Such as a walk to the park or around the block two or three times a day. Powerful. <laughs> habits are easily built, only necessitating a few repetitions. Hundreds of repetitions, actually. Mm. However, they are difficult to break, and sometimes sophisticated processes are needed to do so. Wow. Hmm. Wow. That's wow. All this, 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 is, this, is, this is Let's just read the rest of this book right now. This is, anyway. You ready for a six hour podcast? Back to the habit piece. You got good habits, you got bad habits. Mm -hmm. Let's say you got a dog that's peeing on your floor mm. every day, same place. Maybe you're doing the same thing. You're walking to your back door, let's go outside. Your dog walks the living room, pee. Why'd you do that? You know what I'm saying? It's a habit. Right. It's a habit. Bad habit. Now we got to. Uh, break that habit that can be that can be pretty difficult you know what i'm saying <clears throat> or, or they go i let him outside and he comes in he just craps right in the middle oh of my yeah. floor every oh time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one or a habit could be you're walking down the street your dog reacts at a dog it's just a habit you see another dog that's just you know, what i do <laughs> you start losing it you know a good habit could be you know uh you start preparing dinner your dog goes lays on their spot you know you got people come in the house your dog goes lays on their spot you're out walking your dog. There's another dog reacting at your dog. Your dog looks at you. Good to go. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So those are some examples of good habits that we like to build here at Canine Revolution Dog Training. Right? You guys got anything Which to add to that? Which is why we do our routines and routines rituals. Routines and rituals. That's what we're doing. We're building habits. We're building good up habits. good habits. Building up really good habits, boys. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that's going to be it for this book. But again, Dog Language and Encyclopedia of Canine Behavior. Great book. You guys should definitely check that out if you're into the sciencey stuff. All right. Next book, Bruce The Dog's Fogel. Mind. Mm. Understanding Your Dog's Behavior by Bruce Fogel. Right. This is a powerful book. This book is really sciencey too, but it's, it's a such good a good one. book. It's a really good one. I've read this so many times, and you still learn something new every time. Yeah. Right. This book was published in 1990. The so 90s, it's, man. It's They're older. Great. Yeah. It's older material. A lot of it. Still applies very strongly today, but there is new material as well. So this book's going to break it down into a couple parts. Part one of the book is the anatomy and physiology of the dog's mind. Part one of the book is what lost Chris the first time he had to read this book. <laughs> Just got too sciencey. Like, I was better on the second time through. We have our little discussion. Chris is like, I don't even, I don't even know what I read. <laughs> I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> There's no pictures. <laughs> yeah, Chris likes pictures. Part two of the book is the psychology of the dog's mind, where we talk about early learning, later learning. You know, when they're puppies, when they're older adults, social behaviors, breed differences, that kind of stuff, right? So let's pop through here while I'm, while I'm scrolling through here. You guys got anything to tag about this book real quick? Uh, just super science -y. again, take it slow. Take your take time it slow, with it. Take your time. I mean, this is a good one to read for what, well, I mean, both of them are, but for what we were just talking about, understanding your dog's perspective. That's, mm -hmm. that's what this is going into, your mm -hmm. dog's mind, how they think, how they, how they live, how they perceive the world. So. All right, so in the introduction here, he starts off with a bold statement. We can never get into the minds to truly understand how they think, but we can surmise in as a scientific a way as possible, but also in as empathetic a way as possible, right? He's talking about the dog's mind. You don't really know. You're not in the mind to really understand what exactly they're thinking, but based on your scientific understanding, based on your own empathy, your own uh, emotions, your energy states, you can uh, surmise the best possible conclusion as to what that dog is, is how it's operating at that point in time, right? 
that's a powerful statement. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But you really, I mean, you're not going to know exactly. Nobody really knows. Until we can hook up a machine to a dog and read its mind. Yeah. All right. So then uh, chapter three, he's talking about the senses, right? He's talking about all the different senses. I'm just going to go through here real quick and read a couple highlights. The first uh, one is touch that he talks about, and touch is the earliest and possibly the most important of all the canine senses, right? He also says that uh, in here, uh, it is more important than any other sense for the development of the normal adult, and dogs that are deprived of touch will grow to become subordinate, fearful, and withdrawn. So that's that early socialization piece. You got puppies. Obviously, you don't want to go to a not a legit breeder. You want to go to a legit breeder because a lot of times a legit breeder is going to incorporate touch uh, activities with the dog every day to make sure they're properly socialized with the puppy every day, you know. All right. uh, the The next sense that he talks about is taste. The only other sense that is functioning at birth is taste. Okay. Let's see. He goes through a bunch of experiments when they tested uh, do dogs like warm food, do they like cold food, all that kind of stuff. Talks about uh, palatability, you know, good to go. Let's go to the next sense, which is hearing. So he said that, in fact, dogs can actually hear sounds from four times the distance we can, but they still hear the sounds in a broadly similar fashion. And dogs are better at detecting higher notes than we are. So everybody already knows that dogs can hear better than you are, you know, but four times the distance of what we can hear and at a, at the same about level, you know, that we're like, you guys are listening to me right now. The dog can hear me four times away at the same level, which is crazy. I know. Mm-hmm. I can barely hear you across the table. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's just that wow. age getting to you. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't cleaned my ears in a while. Next is vision. So then he talks about uh, <laughs> vision. Although the dog is perhaps 10 times more sensitive to peripheral movement, he has poor close vision, though reasonably good vision at a distance. So they see better on the sides Mm -hmm. than they do in front. And that's through, well, if you look at the dog's anatomy, and again, everything I'm talking about, we've, we've learned in our book discussions. But if you look at the dog anatomy, wolves, their eyes are more to the side of their head so they can get that side peripheral angle. We have bred a lot of dogs as humans where their eyes are more frontly focused. So that may have changed in some breeds, but they're still going to be better at peripheral vision than close, uh, you know, forward vision. When you got start getting in front of the dog, they're going to be using their nose a lot more. All right. Let's see here. Flip another page. And scent, obviously we know dogs are really, really good at scent. Okay, scent is undoubtedly the most important of the dog's practical senses, but it's the most difficult for us to comprehend as humans. We still, we don't really comprehend uh, the intensity of the dog's scent, right? Uh, We do know that dogs have smell memories. They last for life. So a lot of times, you know, we've, we've trained a dog. We don't see him for like two years. Then all of a sudden we see that person and that dog again at a group class or follow up or something like that. At first the dog doesn't recognize us. They come up, sniff us. They start losing it, you know, because they're so excited because that scent memory comes back in, you know. It's kind of like us with the bad daddy's burger. You (laughs) smell that smell and next thing you're like, I know, I know what that is. Holy cow. All right. All right. So let me flip through here, get some more goodies out of this book. Just so you guys get a taste of it. Just a taste. But y'all really need to just go buy it. Just a taste. You should should go buy this book. Make sure you're good to go. Maybe maybe we can do a revolution reading episode. Mm. Read it. Read the whole book? Yeah, whole thing. All right. All right, so... uh, You should have that just buy an audio book. No, no, no. It's it's us reading. (laughs) One thing he does go into detail on in this book is, you know, how dogs communicate, which is super important, obviously. Uh, But one thing that's very important is how they visually communicate. And that's going to be through tail position, ear position, head position. So he's even got diagrams in this book where he shows you, you know, how a dog is going to change their body posture to go from calm to alert to aggressive. How your dog is going to go from calm to alert to submissive. 
So those diagrams are really, really nice. But let's go through some basic ones that he, uh, you know, lists out uh, descriptively. Dogs signal some of their feelings in this way. Calm, ears and tail relaxed. That's going to look different for every dog, right? Alert, ears and tail up. Aggressive, hackles up, tail up, rump up, lips pulled back. Increased aggressive, snarl with teeth exposed, straight stance. Frightened, ears flattened back, tail between legs. Fear, crouched with tail between legs. Abject submission, lying down, hind leg lifted, urinates. Greet, licking the face, beg regurgitating food or play bow. Beg regurgitating food is like jumping up at you, licking at your face type situation, right? It's All right. The root behavior. That's where it, the licking the face comes from. That's right. No, it's kisses. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. They the want issues. you to puke in their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's another highlight. Dogs that are denied direct human contact until they are over 12 weeks of age seldom make good companions. So that's why it's uh, very important. And this book does a really good job of breaking down puppies, you know, in chapter six. Here's another uh, highlight. Pups raised in complete isolation to seven weeks of age could still recover completely and become socially normal. They also reported that outside contacts as infrequent as twice a week and for only 20 minutes each time were enough to ensure normal development as long as these outside contacts occurred in the critical period between four and 12 weeks. All right. So, again, he's talking about contact with humans right here. He does break it up and how a pup should be uh, made contact with in the development of the dog's mind. Right? He said from zero to two weeks is a neonatal period. From uh, two to four weeks of age is the transitional period. From four to six weeks of age is a socialization period to dogs specifically. And then from four to 12 weeks of age is the socialization period uh, to humans specifically. So those timelines are really good to know, especially if you're raising a puppy. Maybe you're talking to a breeder. you got some questions you can yeah. ask them. You can pull from this book. You know, good to go. And did you know that, uh, well, you would know if you read this book, even when the puppy is developing in the mother's womb, they are already being imprinted on based on what the mother is going through. Mm-hmm. So if the mother's super stressed during the pregnancy, that puppy could be more stressed. Mm-hmm. You know, they could have more stressed characteristics or traits, right? Yep. If the mother is uh, having a good time, not stressed, calm, that sets the puppy up for success. This right? is why a lot, like we've mentioned this several times in several episodes, like you're going to a breeder, always ask to see the parents, you know, get, oh, yeah. kind of assess them as well. Oh, yeah. And the environment, of course. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, just crazy environment yeah, just, yeah. just leave yeah <laughs> yeah like, they're all in a bathtub yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right uh actually the next chapter we did cover in a podcast chapter eight that talks specifically about aggression what aggression is in dogs we already talked about that in a separate podcast so go check that out in one of our previous episodes he has another chapter that talks about eating exploring eliminating that's peeing peeing and, and pooping, pooping. That's, that was my favorite chapter. Yep. <laughs> that was your favorite one? Yeah. The scat <clears throat> chapter. Let's see. On page 137, we talk about prey carrying. Some people may be curious about this, you know, so that some dogs develop the habit of taking their food out of their food bowl, carrying it to another place and eating it there. This is based on the wolf's prey carrying activity, genetics, and instinct, right? So, again, our dog's ancestor is the wolf. Why does my dog take food out of the food bowl, take it over to the carpet, and eat it there? You know, it's based on that prey-carrying activity that comes from the wolf. Make a kill, carry it back to the den. Good to go. Feast. (laughs) All right. Obesity. Oh, wow. That's a big one. That's a good one. Let's let's read this highlight. That was a big chapter. (laughs) (laughs) You got jokes. Cut that part out, Ben. (laughs) Obesity. It is extremely rare to see fat canines of any species in the wild. And this is because most animals have a refined ability to adjust their consumption 
of food to meet their energy requirements. And because they're not getting chicken and cheese for dinner every night. <laughs> and because they die. <laughs> Obesity in dogs is a man-made problem. To begin with, we have allowed dogs that would have been too fat to survive in the wild to survive and reproduce. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, there is now there is now a genetic predis- predisposition to fatness in certain breeds and in others. Again, human intervention, you know, has changed some things about the dog world. Worst thing that ever happened to dogs. Perverse as it sounds, the housebound dog leads a stressed existence. Wow! If your dog wow. is bound to the house, it leads a stressed existence. It cannot express its natural behaviors: stalking. Chasing, exploring, investigating. The brain endorphins might increase in states of anxiety and be in some way related to obesity. So get out with your dog. Allow them to use their natural uh, instincts. Good to go. Just go on a walk. It helps your dog's obesity. It may help yours. You know, Routines, rituals, Routines physical, rituals. mental stimulation. Routines and rituals. Set the tone for the pack. This is another good piece. I'm getting off on a tangent here. <laughs> All right, so uh, why dogs might urinate in the wrong place, right? Number one, lack of house training. So we're talking about dogs that, uh, you know, they pee all over the place, different places. Maybe you don't like it, right? One reason could be lack of house training, which means we have to train the dog not to use the bathroom in the house, to use it outside. Easy date. All right, number two, territorial marking, right? Did you know? Urine marking reduces a dog's anxiety by masking any other dog's own odor with its own. Or you could just give your dog the pack structure. Good to go. Anxiety resolved, right? Mm-hmm. But that may be a reason why your dog is anxious. Maybe a reason why your dog is trying to mark everything because of this territory marking, right? Number three, it could be separation anxiety. So maybe you leave the house, your dog takes a crap on your floor or pees on your floor. Could be, could be rooted in separation anxiety. We don't know. Got to peel away the onion layers, but we'll figure it out. Another one could be fear, right? You get, got that dog, you walk into the store, all of a sudden, you know, dropping Drops a load. One. Talking about that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> got one right now. Sorry, Lowe's. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, Home Depot. <laughs> Next Maybe one could be excitement. Nice <laughs> you know, your dog might urinate because of excitement, uh, which uh, you got to train the dog to, uh, you know, handle exciting situations a different way. You know, so they don't do that. Then you've also got an over submissive dog that's a very submissive. They could urinate when they're simply looked at or touched. You know, they're just, uh, you know, they can't handle it. <laughs> they can't handle it. That sounded weird. Cut that part out. Phoenix Fire is really going to like that, that one. Is that what you sound like? Shout- <laughs> He's just <laughs> in the bathroom. Hey, ah! Shout out to Phoenix Fire. If you're watching this episode, leave us a comment. <laughs> Anybody reading? Every, anybody watching this episode, leave us a comment on that. Uh, you're gonna get a comment. Sound right. That one got me. <laughs> <laughs> Another one could be uh, all right, boys. Bring it real, reel it in. Another one could be wrong diet. You know, dogs having the bad diet, or your dog could be doing it to get attention. Even if it's negative attention, right. they get they get some form of attention from you every time they urinate. Oh, they might be start doing it. You know could be a disease could be inbreeding it could be early experience you know that's just what how it was from day one right so anyway good good material in this book let me flip back to the back here see if there's anything at the end oh yeah here we go conclusion the fact remains that the dog's mind works in its own specific ways and with objectives that are not necessarily obvious to us by understanding these differences we can become more responsible for our pet's behavior and at the same time make their lives more stimulating and fulfilling. Mm. We often, uh, er, here's, all right, this is a hard hitter. Because we have taken the dog into our homes and our hearts, we have the opportunity to observe his behavior more closely than we can observe any other animal species. This is a double-edged sword, for we often make the mistake of interpreting his behavior in human Rather than canine terms, What's we forget called? his ancestry. I think that's called anthropomorphism. That's anthropomorphism. We learned about that, that in the other book. About in the other book. That's if another paying attention. moment too. Right? <clears throat> it all comes together. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the dog's mind. That's a great book. Highly recommended. 
it is a little bit sciencey at the beginning, but then it makes more sense as you keep going through. Just read it five times, you'll get it. Good to go. I mean, Bruce Fogel and uh, Roger Brantes in yep. general, you know, they got a lot of good stuff out they there. They got good stuff. All right, so now we're going to dive into some human books. The first one, Hate very humans. popular, <laughs> How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Classic. This is the 80th anniversary edition that I have right here. Okay. That's old book. So this is a freaking good book. This book was published in, uh, let's see here, 1936. Holy <laughs> That's crazy, 30s. dude. Good years. <laughs> mm. All right. So let's jump into some stuff. So this guy's got a lot of principles. He goes through a lot of stories about how to use these principles. So let's find some of these principles in the book and, and uh, kind of discuss them real quick. All right. So he breaks his book down into different sections, segments. And the first segment is fundamental techniques and handling people. He's got three principles. Principle number one, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. We don't like complainers. If it's Not hot outside, here. get after it. If it's cold outside, get after it. Put a hoodie on and then get after it. All right, good to go. If Sun's it's hot outside, bright. if it's hot outside, take your clothes off. Good to go. Remember back in the day when... Chris was the first apprentice. It was just me and Chris. Why we did you that transfer pool. from take your clothes off to <laughs> immediately talking about? We had that pool. I come to no, I come to work one day. All of a sudden, Chris is in the pool naked. That's Chris. that was. It's not hot. Accurate. Chris is like, oh, I thought this is what we did. Uh, I got I got video <laughs> footage that it, that shows it was the opposite way around. <laughs> Better watch out. Some people might pay you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I've already sold it. <laughs> All right. Principle number two: Give honest and sincere appreciation. That's one thing we as a society fail to do a lot. Give honest and sincere appreciation, right? And then number three, arouse in the other person an eager want. Why should you want to do this, right? Why should you want your dog trained? Because it's going to make your life so much better. It's and your dog's going to make your life. walks so much better. Your dog's going to enjoy their life. They're not going to have the anxieties, the insecurities. They're not going to live a sedentary lifestyle. That's right. They're not going to be obese. Good to go. All right. The next section is called Six Ways to Make People Like You. Right? And you may say, I don't want people to like me. Well, you do. You do. <laughs> you live in a community. You got friends, family, neighbors, whatever. Right? Maybe you're in business and you got to interact with a lot of different people. People aren't going to do business with somebody that is not good at relationship. Right? Mm -hmm. So principle number one, become genuinely interested in other people. So become interested in that person, what they're about, their life, you know, what they have going on, right? Principle number two, smile. Let me see you guys smile. <laughs> you guys got to work on that. <laughs> I have to do mine in the moment, like when I walk Samantha, in. Samantha, let happens. me see you smile. There's a smile. Wow. Samantha's that got some like work to do. That looked like something from a scary movie. She's got some better. work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Principle number three, remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language people love hearing their name right yes they do chad kevin i don't like my name you don't like your name okay kevin. most people kevin's like he's, he's well, we'll talk about that in the next book that's the warrior warrior yeah. doesn't really yeah, care yeah. you know right. romantic they want to hear your oh, name i like my name christopher. Right? my name's the best name i mean since christopher d tipton <laughs> really d i don't know what to say <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> Chris D T. Ooh, All right, Jet's taking me out. What was day. the rap name? What? Chris T. Chris, Chris T. T. That's right. Chris T. What was? Yours? Did you have one? Little John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to cut the spots video in the middle of that yeah, one for Phoenix Fire. If you're still listening, <laughs> leave us a comment below again. All right, and then look at our spots video. If anybody's wondering who Phoenix Fire is, he's the our number one YouTube subscriber. Comments on every video. He's good to go, boys. Nice. I'll tell you. I'll tell you off the air. Right. Keeping his identity. You can't can't okay. reveal his identity. I can't reveal it. <laughs> All right. Principle number four: Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. So yeah. instead of when you're talking to somebody, instead of saying, I did this, I did that. Hey, how was your day? What'd you do this weekend? What do you have planned for the day? How are you doing? 
and then oh. genuinely be interested. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, yeah. how, how often do you hear the fake stuff? Oh, how was your day? Oh, cool. That's nice. Now back to me. Right. Oh, yeah. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Like, genuinely be interested in what they're saying and try to get to know the, the people. Exactly. Make yourself likable. Good point there. This is good stuff. And that goes into the next principle, talk in terms of the other person's interests. So don't always be about yourself. Mm -hmm. Hey, how was your day? Oh, you went ice skating. Is that something you like to do? I don't. I don't know. I just tell me more about that. <laughs> ice skating. You live in the south. Did you have a good weekend? <laughs> we have an ice skating week in Somerville. It's, it's hey, like a how 10 was your weekend? Yeah, yeah. Ten by ten slab. Hey, how was your weekend? Well, I cut the grass. Oh, what kind of lawnmower do you have? Oh, okay, okay. Ooh, John Deere with a flat talking. tire. Now we're talking. What kind of grass? I'm more interested in the grass. What kind of grass you got? <laughs> what kind of grass is it? Rye grass? Is it soy shoes? Got this Bermuda on half the yard. Nice Bermuda. <laughs> Big time import. <laughs> All right. Principle number six, make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. Right? Don't be a faker. Make them feel feel important. And you're going to do that just by talking about what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Be a good listener. Encourage them to talk about themselves and uh, talk in terms of their interests. Right? All right. The next section, how to win people to your way of thinking. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Super important. Okay? Especially if you're in business, right? Maybe someone, uh, so like what we do, dog training. There's so much information out there about dog training. There's a lot of stuff you got to sift through. You know what I'm saying? If uh, people are, are uh, you know, working with us, we need them to have a certain way of approaching things and situations. How are we going to do that? You know, this section can help us. Number one, uh, the only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. Don't get into a back and forth argument with someone. That's not helping anybody. That's going to raise the ego level up. You know what I'm saying? Stick with facts. Avoid the argument if you can. Find something that you're both on the on the same ground about, right? How many how many times you see people these days are looking for? You go on Facebook. People oh, yeah. are looking for arguments. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Number two, show respect for the other person's opinions. Never say you're wrong. Right? Mm. I would say something Especially like, to your wife. <laughs> Not recommended. These do apply in your relationship as well. <laughs> What's worse, you're wrong or whatever? Oh, well, usually are, that's what follows you're both wrong. Both are bad. <laughs> you're wrong. Whatever. Both are bad. <laughs> Principle number three, if you are wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. Mm. Just like the other day, we had a little miscommunication with one of our clients. We messed up an appointment time. We, once we identified that, we quickly admitted it, took all the blame, and then got them on the right path. Right? Yeah. Easy. It's easy to be, oh, well, this is why this happened. This is, you know, make all these excuses. Yep. Just own, own it. it. Own, own it. it. And then move forward. Apologize. Stay sincerely. Make it right. Good to go. Principle number four, begin in a friendly way. You know, so don't just walk up to somebody, start attacking them. <laughs> hey, you suck. <laughs> you want to sign up? Yeah. <laughs> Principle number five, get the other person saying yes, yes immediately. So ask them a question where they're going to feel encouraged and uh, ready to move forward with. Are you awesome? Oh, yeah. Do you want your dog to stop peeing in your house? Yes. <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> If I was a car salesman, hey, you like this truck right here? Oh, yeah. Ram I don't know. Is it a Dodge? No. <laughs> Show me the Fords. You want this power? You better get this Dodge. I need that power. Do you need this power? Yes. yes. No. No one needs that. <laughs> it's garbage. Oh my yeah, God. I need the 4x4. Four four. I never go off-road. but. All right, let me ask you this question. Do you like uh, your car breaking down and repairing it often? Yes, because it makes me a better mechanic. Then you should get a Ford. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going there. <laughs> All right, principle six, let the other person do a great deal of the talking. So, again, let them be a good listener. That's yeah. what it comes down to. Principle seven, let the other person feel like an idea is his or hers. We've all met that person. According to Merriam-Webster, one who listens to someone or something. What did you, how did you trigger my voice activation? Android listening to us. <laughs> It's happening. Freaking so government. letting the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. Maybe you're having a conversation with somebody and they take your idea and they use it to get, you know, someone's attention. Let them have it. You know what I'm Say, saying? Say, that's a good idea. That's a great idea. Now let's go do it. Yeah. Get the mission done, you know. I mean, how many times have we done that? We might, you know, find ourselves saying the same thing over and over and then 
Chris may come in and say it, and then it just clicks. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, you know what? As long as you got the information, yeah. that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like how you brought Chris up in that again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Principle number eight. Try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. This is a big one. Yeah. Look at it from the other person's perspective, which means you got to stop yourself, mm. slow down, put yourself in their shoes, whatever the situation is. Does this make sense from their perspective? If so, I understand it. I might have to communicate to them in a different way, but now I can understand where they're coming from. It's not about you versus me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Let's try to think about it from each other's side. It takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of discipline to do that. Discipline equals discipline equals freedom. That's right. Discipline yeah. Jocko equals will freedom. listen to us one day. Yeah, one and sometimes day. I mean slowing it down. Because a lot of times people are quick, quick, quick oh, yeah. on their emotions. Mm -hmm. yep. Take a break. Think this through. Take a break. Think it through. Good to go. Principle, uh, principle nine. Be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. So don't just shut it down. And this is what I'm, I've been bad at this in my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Does Lauren listen to this? No way. No. She doesn't listen. <laughs> if something happens, right? She's like, I think we should put a fence up around the back porch. No. <laughs> Heck no. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I need to be sympathetic with that, you know, yeah. or have a different discussion so that we can honestly see things from each other's point of view. So when are you putting the fence up? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> we start tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number 10 appeal to the nobler motives so again it's not about you it's about the bigger picture right dramatize your ideas is number 11 number 12 throw down a challenge like what we did we threw down the 21 day challenge not many people passed it couple of it couple of uh, you know dedicated people did but mm -hmm. a lot of people you know disappointed me takes a lot of discipline to do the 21 day challenge it's, it's hard. not easy not an easy challenge. It's hard. Yep. But people that did it, they're going to reap the benefits. And it's still available. If you're an alumni, you go on the Facebook page, pull up the announcements, you'll see it on there. Mm -hmm. It will make a difference in your relationship. All right. Last but not least, how to be a leader. A leader's job often includes changing your people's attitudes and behavior. Some suggestions to accomplish this. Number one, begin with praise and honest appreciation. No matter what you're doing, you know, you guys are leaders to our clients, right? When you're in their house, hey, maybe they're struggling with spot, but you do some healing before that. Hey, your, hey, your healing is great. Now we just need to tune in on the spot stuff. You know what I'm saying? Get us on the same track. Number two, call attention to people's mistakes indirectly. Sometimes you do have to be direct, mm -hmm. you know, but you want to first try to do it indirectly, right? That way there's no ego issues. That way there's no me versus you issues, you know, but you still have to help that person. Principle number three, talk about your own stakes, mistakes before criticizing the other person, right? So whatever you got going on, whatever the situation is, hey, you know, I've been really bad about this. You know, I've been doing this. I've been doing that. I've caught myself do the same thing. Yep, I got to tune it in. Here's what I'm doing, <clears throat> right? Number four, ask questions instead of giving direct orders. Some people hate this because I'm a I'm big question asker. Samantha's like, how do I do this? I'm like, I don't know. How do you do it? <laughs> she's, she's sleeping. She's napping. She's sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but ask questions instead of, instead of giving direct orders, right, in a, in a way that builds that person up and develops them. You know what I'm saying? And then principle five, let the other person save face. So don't chew them out, you know, if you're, you shouldn't be chewing somebody out, but, yeah. you know, don't, don't raise Cain in a group. Or know? let them, you know, make them look bad. Yeah, you don't know? let them look bad. Yep. <sighs> Number six, praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement, right? So someone, they've been struggling with the spot, for example, with us, we do a follow up give them some things to work on we go back some of those things have been tuned in good to go hey great job great job good work now let's keep pushing stay on the path for these last couple things right principle seven give the other person a fine reputation to live up to so lead by example right but also build them up build up their reputation principle eight use encouragement make the fault seem easy to correct right hey you know uh so-and-so broke heel position 
let's let's talk about how we're going to tune that in real quick you know easy to correct not a big deal number nine make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest hey if you get this you're going to have x y and z if you get your spot done you're going to have x y and z that you won't have to worry about you know what i'm saying so just some examples there but uh this is a great book how to win friends and influence people really thick it's a thick book but it's got a lot of lessons in here that you can apply if you're in business if you're in a relationship just with your friends just general life general life good to go makes you a better person makes you a better person that's what it's about not bad for the 30s yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Might need it's to be still up. like a top seller too yeah. yeah oh yeah you know that just tells you how powerful that uh that material is mm -hmm. right all right then the last book that we're going to talk about today is the power of understanding people oh yeah this is a book we just recently finished is very powerful opened up our eyes to a lot of stuff by david mitchell Let's see when this book was published this is probably newer 2014 but uh this is a great book right so real quick to summarize this book basically in this book he says that people are going to break down into one or two of four, what is it, interactive styles is mm -hmm. what he calls mm -hmm. it. So there's four interactive styles that every person falls into. Number one is the romantic. And what's an example of a romantic? Someone that's... Uh, I mean, they like, the. that's like a little bit of what we were talking about in this last book. They like appreci to be appreciated. Yep. They're, they're more uh, emotion driven, mm -hmm. you know. They want to take uh, care of uh, others like yep. for themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Emotion driven, taking care of others. They do not want to hurt people's feelings. Don't like Avoid conflict. They right? don't like conflict. They're about relationship, you know. Mm -hmm. Your second one is a warrior, right? Warriors are going for uh, they're going for efficiency. They're straight going for value. The straight to the point. They like to get things done. As, don't waste time. As quickly as and effectively as possible. That's right. Don't waste any time. Uh, the next one would be, let me get to it real quick. Next one would be the expert. And methodical. Methodical. Yeah. They like uh, facts, process, approaches. Standard right? operating procedures. Think they're, bullet points. They're not step stubborn. Step. They're right. They're always right. <laughs> they do the research. I guess we know who the expert is around here. <laughs> All right, and then the last, the fourth one is the mastermind. It's all over the place. Someone <laughs> who's, uh, you know, sensitive to the possibilities of the environment. They like to explore, experience new things, think outside the box. They don't even know there's a box. They're just out there, just going crazy. They're distracted, you know. They're distracted by this and that. And if you're talking to someone, they're talking, and all of a sudden they're gone. They're either mentally or verbally or just physically gone somewhere else. <laughs> they're not. You're boring to them. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? They don't. Yeah. They don't not like you. You're just right. boring. So You've they, lost they, their. They're a mastermind. They gotta. Yeah. Uh, they gotta go. They like. Uh, the, they like the adventure. Yeah. You know, they're adventurers. Like exciting things. <laughs> exciting things. But like that constant feed of excitement. Uh, vacations. They new they places. Love they love vacations. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Don't lie. <laughs> they said they. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought he said he does. So, uh, so anyway, those are the four interactive styles, and everybody's going to have a primary and a secondary interactive style. So Chris, for example, his primary interactive style is romantic. Secondary style is warrior. That's an interesting combination. But what that means is Chris is sensitive. Always Chris. have been. <laughs> yeah, been with that one. Been like, been like that one. <laughs> Chris is sensitive. Chris yeah. likes appreciation. He likes relationship. I do. He likes taking care of people. He likes it when he's taken care of. Hey, let me just say, I appreciate you guys. We appreciate you, Chris. Yeah. You didn't say my name when you talked about Kevin. <laughs> they also <laughs> romantics like to hear their name. Important. Yeah. But Chris is also a warrior, which means he likes to be efficient. He doesn't like to waste time. That is true. Which those two interactive styles are kind of like, you know, sometimes in yeah. conflict, but good to go. I mean, you can you can be romantic while you're getting stuff done, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's me. <laughs> All right, Kevin is a warrior, number one, warrior, number two, expert. So warrior, again, efficient, doesn't like small talk. Kevin's really good at small talk, though. Faking it. He fakes it. <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes, I mean, I'm into it, you know? Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. it's good. I have a, you know, I think everybody has tendencies of all four. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. just dominant ones. I remember uh, 
Because uh, since, you know, there's a test in this book for those that don't know that you can take. I'm sure you can look it up online and take it as well. Uh, but reading it will help you understand it thoroughly. But as you're going through all four, you'll see things like in Mastermind, I see stuff. I'm like, oh, well, I do that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but there have been people that have had to take the test where they've had one predominant one mm -hmm. and then two that were like dead even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it was like a warrior expert mastermind. It's like, how do you even. Crazy. You yeah. know? How do you function? Yeah. Not it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But no, so another thing about the warrior is they're blunt and they're not being rude or anything. Yeah. It's just their personality. It's just their interactive right. style. But, and honestly, but to, a, to a romantic. Right. Right. Now right. there could be like if Kevin's talking to me, I don't know Kevin. Yeah. And he's just very straight into the point. I'm like, oh, Kevin hates me. He well, the good like news me. is all these years I just thought I was a dick. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you are. You just are. Just a warrior. Yeah. <laughs> you're not a dick. You're a warrior. <laughs> warrior dick. <laughs> so wow, so, that'll get cut. <laughs> All right, here we go. But anyway, so another thing about the warrior too is like, like Chris already said, people they don't understand the warrior interactive style. And honestly, up until we read this book, like this book opened our eyes to yeah. like so much stuff. Yeah. But uh, if you don't understand that, you're like, dude, I don't, I don't get this person. Right. Like they're being rude, but they act like this. Mm -hmm. and, you know, right. They're just a warrior, straight up. Yeah. Now you understand that. Now you're like, oh, okay. And the thing about this book, too, is it's going to uh, help you, coach you how to work with that person, how to communicate with that person if they're not a good interact, not a suitable, you know, similar interactive style. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Especially for us, we do. We go into people's houses. We're dealing with a ton of different people. Yep. And so this has helped us learn how to adjust our communication methods to speak into that person's yeah. preferred interactive style. And we I mean, also know how to identify the yeah. interactive style and change your. I mean, it changed my perspective on the whole thing. You know, like talk, like think about how he talks about masterminds. You might have somebody that's going, you know, doing all. You're talk, trying to talk to them. They look at their phone. They're they're doing something else, and you yeah. think this person's being rude, but yeah. really, it, it now it's changed the perspective to well, I've not I'm not doing something that's interesting them. I'm boring them. So yeah. how what, how can I change myself mm. to to keep their attention? That kind of stuff. Yeah. One thing for me. <laughs> Excuse me. Because I'm an expert, I'm very, and my brain is bullet points, you know, I have to do this and mm -hmm. I have to do that. Mm -hmm. Like, so a return, for example, I go in to do taking a dog home to somebody. I want to go through my expert bullet points and I got a mastermind in front of me. Like you said before, I think this person's rude. Like, why aren't you staying on track right. with me? But now I understand the interactive style. I'm like, okay, I can tell when I'm losing them. So I'm like, all right, let's start working. Yeah. You got to keep it. You got to go with the flow. You got to keep it interesting. You got to change it up based on that interactive style yeah warriors they want to be really efficient so they want to get the material get the information work with the dog be done they don't want small talk they don't want this they just want to get it and get out or like a saying? warrior expert who's already read the handbook already got yep. all the info they're good to go they say i know yeah. everything all right let's just <laughs> let me just see how to do this okay yeah. okay i had this question all right we're done right and you're like man they're pushing me out yeah they don't yeah. want to hang out with me exactly no, they, yeah. they got stuff to do <laughs> see you on tuesday at 3 <laughs> <Yeah>. 30 <laughs> so kevin's that warrior expert you know, and then me personally, I'm an expert uh, romantic, mm -hmm. expert romantic. So expert side of me, very systematic. My brain's very systematic. I do a lot of research on things before we execute. And then romantic, just like what we talked about with Chris, you know, into relationship, into appreciation, into all that stuff. How close know? were your uh, romantic and warrior columns? Very close. Yeah. <laughs> thought, thought so. <laughs> you think I'm a warrior, too? No, I got a little, little bit of you, you know. I warriors be, recognize warriors. <laughs> I can, yeah, yeah. I can be a warrior at times. I want to be really efficient, too. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's sometimes. how my warrior. I think warrior, that falls under expert, too. It's, sometimes. They all kind of very That's how my, my warrior and expert were pretty, yeah. pretty close. Yeah. So, but like you said, I see a lot of commonalities yeah on all of them but this book is a great book highly recommended for anybody because this is not only going to affect if you're in business or a leader but also just a relationship aspect you know what i'm saying better understanding your spouse better your understanding kids your spouse your family members once you read it, it's almost something that you don't even have to think about yeah yeah you just realize it because oh, yeah. you have the knowledge and you just adjust you remember what that's called hmm? that's you remember called, what that's called uh, metacognition yeah. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Understanding and developing your own thought processes. <laughs> processes. That comes from this book. Good to go. <laughs> highly recommended, honestly. All four of these books, highly, highly recommended. Two from the dog side, two from the people side. Did you guys have anything else to touch on these books? 
No. But I mean, these are great books. Read them. Check know, them out. Read them. Read one chapter a week. You'll get through these in a year. Good to go. Report to us with your findings. Report to Send us. Send us a book report. Write a book report. <laughs> 15 Email pages it. long, bullet format. <laughs> Expert. <laughs> what's, what's that style you have to write in? MLA. So? MLA style. Yeah. I don't. I never did yeah. figure that what that is. That That's why I failed all my papers <laughs> in college. I never went to college. So. <laughs> but for us, we're reading books every week. You know, we're furthering our development. Well, actually, right now. There we go. Oh, here we, I knew this was going to come I as, up. I assigned a book for the trainers to read. Chris, why don't you have your book? A month and a half <laughs> ago. Kevin just got it. And then last week they they tell me as I've read the the assigned reading and I'm pumped. I'm like <laughs> losing it. I'm like this is so good. It's actually written yeah. by Bruce Vogel who wrote The Dog's Mind. It's another book from him because that book is so good. But anyway, I'm like losing it. I'm so pumped for the discussion. Both or first I see Chris and Kevin over there whispering. <laughs> They're like, hey, I didn't get the book. Did you get the? Uh, oops, oops. <laughs> it's not. Hey, accurate. Chad, we got to tell you something. We haven't gotten the book yet. Major letdown. <laughs> Major let. We didn't know you were going to pick the rarest book in existence. <laughs> yeah, put the order book. in. It's like, Listen, yeah, it'll be there a, in like maybe two months. We got a global <laughs> pandemic going on. All right, shipping is taking a little longer than you. They told me February second, and I got it yesterday. Well, I it's still like January. It. What was yesterday? Yeah. Like the seventeenth or something. I, I might know. need to check my mailbox. It's a good book, though. It's it's going to be. We'll a take good your book. word for it. <laughs> the, the reviews are insane. Uh. The book is called The Games Pets Play. The Games Pets Play. How by not to Bruce be manipulated Vogel. by your pet. We'll probably have some episodes on it, you think? Oh yeah. Oh definitely. <laughs> I almost when I read the first chapter, I was about to say this is gonna be our next podcast. I was like, This discussion is gonna be crazy and you guys let me down. Even the back of the book, like just reading the footnotes, it was like, What? <laughs> Are like there uh, Bruce Vogel goes from this to you know something oh, yeah. a little? Are there little any wild. pictures? Any yeah. pictures? Oh yeah, there's pictures. There's a lot of illustrations. Color? Are they color? No. Uh, this book's white. from like 1980. Here we go. So, <laughs> Here we go. Or 74 or something. It's from. It's, it's from an a old while book, ago. but it's so good, dude. I'm like losing it reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> the games pets play so good. There's also another book. I'm not going to even bring it up because we're going to read it at some point. Well, if you bring it up, we can go ahead and order it, and it'll be here in time. (laughs) It's another book called The Games People Play. Oh. That's the human element, so we're going to read both Same guy? Same guy? No, it's a different guy. But it's what gave Bruce Vogel the idea to do it about pets. Mm, Nice. All right. But, yeah, I mean, it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. I'm freaking pumped. But the good thing is what's so exciting about reading it the way we read it is, again, we read the material ourselves, and we bring it to the discussion table. And we have some talk about it, some real talk. Real talk, yeah. You know, because I mean, all three of us might perceive something a different way, oh, yeah, and then we, we can talk it about it. And it's a lot of times it's led to other discussions. We end up putting the book down, and we're talking. Lots of discussions. Canine Revolution: life. Dog Training and Psychology. That's yeah. right. That's right. We're branching out man? all over the place. Certified. <laughs> What'd you say, man? <laughs> ben said it happens every day that we just remember at one point on remember tangents. at one point we were like we're gonna record our discussions and then we did one and it was it like was this terrible is, this is it crazy. was literally like 14 minutes in ben goes this is awful <laughs> <laughs> he's like people aren't gonna listen to wasn't it talk. wasn't it the encyclopedia book it was, yeah, it encyclopedia was the encyclopedia book. book we were reading so it is hard to digest again it was too sciencey podcast worked out a lot better yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> but we do pull some excerpts from the books and talk about them on the podcast stuff that people will actually understand yeah you know yeah good to go so Anyway, y'all check those books out. Give us some feedback. Drop us a comment below. Phoenix Fire. Again, if you're if you stayed with us this to this point, let's see a couple comments, buddy. All right, all right. But for all our listeners, we really appreciate you guys. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the podcast. Rate us, review us on on, on your podcast platform. Let us know if you like the podcast. If you have uh, future podcast episodes you'd like us to discuss, let us know in the comments below. Right, like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram, all that good stuff. We got a lot. Of- Ben's <laughs> gonna come on the podcast. Ben he wants just to come said. on the podcast if someone doesn't rate and review us on. And Apple you, you don't, you He's don't want Ben on the thing. That tangent we were talking about earlier. He pops yeah. the mic out. Yeah, when you take the mic out of the holster, starts cutting a promo. All right, like Phoenix WWF. Fire. All right, Phoenix Fire. It's up to you this week. Drop us a review on your Spotify, Apple, iTunes podcast platform. Don't let us down. Otherwise, Ben's going to be on the podcast. He's going to go ham. (laughs) You don't want it. (laughs) You don't want Ben. (laughs) People are like, I want Ben. I'm not going to review it. (laughs) He's a romantic like me. Don't worry. He's a romantic. Don't worry. It'll be all right. All right. Anyway, Samantha's still taking a nap. All right. So we got to move on to our next thing. But anyway, subscribe, like, follow us, all that good stuff. Drop us a comment. We appreciate you guys. Hey, we got a lot of stuff happening in 2021. 
pandemic's coming. Pandemic's still here. Coming. There's one coming. <laughs> <laughs> the pandemic me. is still Need here. Need to activate my Facebook again. <laughs> we got a lot of stuff going on. We got things. We got things that we're working on. Oh yeah. To uh, to canine to revolution. To cure COVID nineteen. <laughs> oh. Well. Canine revolution. Changing the way we're doing things. Well, stay tuned. Good to go. Yeah. All right. Always changing. Enhancing. It's like, it's like ben, ben took the words out of my mouth. It's like, en- it's like it's a revolution. Enhancing the dog and owner relationship. One step at a time. Revolt. All right. All right so Ben's <laughs> kicking us off. All right. Well, appreciate you guys. We'll see you all next time.